Well, kia ora koutou, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webisode. We'll be discussing about the vital importance of native forests to New Zealand and to the world. I'm Vincent Herringer, and I'm the host of the Our Regenerative Future Season 2, Otato Nahiri, or Our Forest, and it's produced by Peer Advantage and Tane's Tree Trust. And also these webisodes, we're very grateful for the collaboration of the, um, the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Over the past year, Pure Advantage and Tane's Tree Trust have taken a deep dive into the regenerative, uh, regeneration of native forests as a source of natural, spiritual and economic value. We've had so much momentum and dialogue around the series, which we're really grateful for and excited about. And these conversations, we hope to spark some cross-sector dialogue and get people thinking about the potential for native forests in a regenerative and restorative economy. In today's webinar, we'll be looking at the current state of New Zealand's native forests, the major issues that threaten them and the potential opportunities for change and growth. And I'll be joined in this by a superb panel of three experts, Professor Warwick Sylvester of Waikato University and also of Tane's Tree Trust, Ramona Radford from Scion and Sheridan Ashford, the co-founder of Future Foresters. In a second, I'll let these fine folk introduce themselves, but just some housekeeping. We are very happy to take your questions, um, simply add them to the chat, and I'll do my best to put them to the panelists if there's time, and there should be time, we've allowed time for it. We'll be finishing at 7.30, but that doesn't mean you have to. There's a ton of great material for you to read on our website, that's pureadvantage.org, pureadvantage.org. And you can follow us on any of your favorite social media channels, except perhaps TikTok. Uh, we are on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And of course, we'll be back again next Tuesday uh, for the second in the seven-part series. Right, well, to our guests, um, I'd really like to um, for you to be introduced to our guests. They're going to tell them a bit about themselves. So they're going to tell us who they are, what they do, and why forests matter to them. And uh, Ramona, maybe we could start with you. Kia ora, thank you for joining us. Who are you? What do you do? Kia ora, Vince. Um, nice to see everyone. Sorry, I've got a, I've got a, a poll on my screen. I'm just going to take that off there. Um, so, uh, ko kapua rangi te maunga, kauta ki rangi ahua, ko tainui waka, ko ngai te iwi, so I'm Ramona Radford. Uh, my people are from the Eastern Bay of Plenty. Um, I work at Scion and have been the lead of uh, Te Ao Māori Capability and Māori Partnerships here. Uh, Scion is a Crown Research Institute um, that is that has a mandate for research science and innovation for forests including uh, standing forests or nahiri. Um, my, my greatest achievement is that I am a nanny. Um, so I, uh, why forests matter so much to me and the world that I belong to. Is that something that you want me to talk about now, Vince? Or well, we, we, we'll, um, we're going to come back to, um, to your role as a nanny. That sounds very interesting, but I suspect <laughs> what, you, um, what you wanted to say is that they matter to you and to your mokopuna. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, to me and my mokopuna, to me and my, my people, uh, to me and the world that I belong to. Um, they, they, they're so important for, for so many reasons. So I'll come back to the, yeah, the, we'll, the we'll reasons explore that why one. later. Yeah, great. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you, Ramona. Warwick, over to you. What do you do in regards to forests and why do they matter to you? Oh, well, firstly, uh, just to uh, reiterate, I've been retired from the university for 12 years. Uh, so that's a bit behind me, uh, but I still team, team, uh, seem to carry that deficit. Um, Otani Tree Trust has been a mission for me because uh, uh, Rob McGowan and I had coffee one day. Some of you may know Pa McGowan, uh, Rob. Uh, and we sat down and said, um, this was in, uh, in the year 2000. And uh, we've been observing the way in which um, native forests suddenly had been, explore, uh, had been exploited, but suddenly were totally closed down. 
Uh, the conservation movement had effectively uh, uh, re reduced any activity within the forest uh, and uh, we, they were closed down. So we thought there's got to be another view. We've got to look at forests uh, in all of their values. We've got to look at all of the values that forests provide. And so uh, a group of us got together, we had a seminar and we formed Tarnage Tree Trust. We'll talk a little bit more about Tarnage Tree Trust later on. Um, but I, I've worked uh, scientifically in forests for a long time. I've worked a lot on nutrient cycling. I've worked with Kauri quite a lot. Um, and uh, uh, I, I have um, a, a feeling in forests that uh, I find is spiritual. When I'm in a forest, I feel an affection for the environment that it creates in me and with the forest itself. So there's more to it than just the science for me. Uh, I, I am uh, the chairman of a trust which manages 100 acres of bush outside of Hamilton where we've taken a, a, a fairly trashed piece of bush and we've turned it into a, a wonderful piece of lowland forest. And uh, that really turns me on. Well, kia ora, Warwick, thank you for sharing that. And you know what they say about um, professors, it's like the Hotel California, you can, you can check out, but you can never leave. <laughs> Sheridan, tell us about your work a little, and tell us a little bit about Future Foresters and we will come back in greater detail, but tell us now, who, who are you and why do forests matter to you? Okay, cool. Thanks, um, Vincent. Um, I work in commercial plantation, exotic forestry. That's my day job. I'm a tra trained forester, but um, I guess kind of why I'm here is I'm part of a group that started the Future Foresters New Zealand and we're really passionate about the next generation of foresters and spreading the word, getting more people involved in forestry because I feel like it's this thing in New Zealand that nobody really knows exists and we just we want more people to know what it is, we want people to know the benefits, we sort of want to help tell that story to the generations that are coming through at the moment and also what will that look like in the future is sort of what turns me on, like Warwick said. And not just for native forests, but exotics as well. All forestry, yeah. I think it's just this part of our landscape that not enough New Zealanders know anything about. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for the brief introductions. Uh, um, Warwick, I might start with you. I want to know um, more about the state of our native forests, because uh, we have the sense that there is a conservation estate, but um, is that conservation estate in, in peril? Is it big enough? Uh, and what, what kind of health is it in? Can you give us a, a kind of a 101 on the state of our native forests? Well, in addressing that, there are two aspects to this. One is the quantity. The other is the quality. Let's address the quantity first of all. New Zealand, prior to the arrival of humans, was about 80% forest. There's very good records of that. When Europeans arrived here, there was about 50% cover of the country was in forest. Today, we've got 30%. So we have lost an enormous amount of forest. So in terms of quantity, we've lost a lot. And most of that, of course, is in the high country. Um, and... Uh, uh, it, it, of course, most of it's in the, the um, uh, uh, conservation estate. Uh, but I, I, I started to look at countries which have less forest in them than we do. There are remarkably few. Well, those that do, you find they're either deserts. Uh, you know, Australia's only got 17% of its country in forest. Uh, and you can mention why that is. You can't grow forests in the desert. Sudan, for example, is 18 uh, the UK, of course, which has been almost essentially deforested, is only 12% of forest. But uh, when you compare New Zealand with other areas, take Japan, which is a country of similar size, well, 120 million people, to support 120 million people on a country which is a bit bigger than New Zealand. How can you how much they've got in forestry? 67% of that country is under forest. They seem to be able to do it. People say you, you can't afford to uh, uh, um, feed yourself unless you have uh, a land and a grass. That's not true. So uh, the history of New Zealand is we've essentially deforested all of the low country and turned it into grass. So that's the quant quantity business. The quality is another one. 
because the, the quality, of course, has also gone downhill because uh, we have introduced into our forest a number of uh, exotic animals, predators of various sorts, uh, weeds. We've allowed grazing into our forest. In fact, many farms have winter grazing inside a bunch of forest, uh, and the piece of forest that I manage is exactly like that. We've got the bird of the animals. We've actually transformed, a period of 15 years, we've transformed that forest. We have planted 9,000 uh, trees amongst it, uh, and we've got another 1,000 to go in actually next month. So I digress, I digress. So uh, we, we have uh, decimated the amount of forest. We've actually ruined a lot of the habitat. I could go into that at great length, but uh, I think that, that, that's an essential summary. And that forest that does exist, um, the main threats would be from what? From further deforestation or is it from pests? Uh, main, mainly from pests. Uh, um, I, I was just a few days ago in, in Doubtful Sound and uh, we were looking at the map and we could see Secretary Island, uh, an island that's had all of the predators taken off it. It's, and and it, it's a wonderful example of what forest can be like. There are increasing examples. And then two days, three days later, I had a night walk in Zealandia, and you know the the uh, fence area in in Wellington, a night walk, uh, um, absolutely fantastic. Two hours in this forest in the middle of the night. Within four minutes, we saw two kiwi, and then a few uh, a few minutes later, we saw two tuatara, and so on went on. Uh, if you go into places like that, uh, Zealandia and, and uh, other places that uh, where predators have been removed, you see what the transformation has been brought about. It's very, very obvious. Ramona, when you think about how much of our Nahiri has been lost, what, what has been lost in the process? You know, what makes our forests so special, you know, so unique in the world? Um, and, and when you think about the loss, you know, what, what does that actually mean? Well, to te ao Māori, the natural world uh, was birthed through a process, um, kōte kōre. Uh, the potential in the void so there was this potential in a, in a space of nothing, nothingness uh, Nā te kore te pō, uh, the form in the darkness began to take shape ki te whaiao, to the glimmer of dawn ki te ao marama, to the bright light of day te hei mauri ora, uh, there is life during this time, the earth and the sky were formed and came into being. Korangi nui ka moi i a papatua nuku ka puta ki waho. Ko tāne nui a rangi. So rangi nui and papatua nuku, sky and earth, uh, gave birth to the forest and many other things. Mm. Uh, at that, that point. So this is a narrative, obviously, from Te Ao Māori. Um, and inside this birthing process, uh, there were many phases and stages. So this narrative acknowledges that the natural world evolved over time. And as a reminder, it keeps us as tangata whenua humble. Uh, and it reminds us to walk gently upon uh, the earth and it also rehumanizes us to our environment. Um, so what does the Nahiri mean to Te Ao Māori? As a word, Nahiri uh, is two ideas combined. Um, combined they mean the binding of the many. Um, so the binding of, of the many trees, you could say, the binding of, of the many ecosystems. Uh, the binding of, of the different worlds, uh, both the human and the natural world, uh, the binding of earth and sky. Um, but the Nahire to Te Ao Māori um, is, is a self-supporting system of life. So it's, it's not, it's a single system that is connected to sky and to earth. Um, and it's not one, you know, those aren't three things to the indigenous people of, of, of the globe. Those are the same thing. And we as humans are a part of that whole. Um, so when I think of what 
the Nahiri means to to me. I think I imagine the great mana or experiencing the great mana um, of the primordial rainforest that once existed here um, and covered the land and the effect of that single living organism, the forest, on the land and the waterways, the cycles of energy and evaporation and the transpiration the transpiration, sorry, I'm reading some of this, uh, that ebbed and flowed with the seasons, um, mm. with the sun and the moon, and moved in the space between sky and earth across generations. And this was the experience of the first peoples to this land. This was the experience that they had. And um, that great forest, as Warwick has said, is no more. Um, there are only remnants of once what uh, of what what once was. Uh, so uh, Pudako narratives and Waiata told by descendants of the first people are the only only living memories that remain of those first primordial forests. So to, to te ao Māori, the Nahiri is everything. It's it's our teacher. It's our, it's our our teaching curriculum. It's our food basket. It's our medicine cupboard. It's um, it's you know as we as we know it's become understood as the lungs of the earth. Um, so the nahiri to te ao Māori is everything. It's interesting, Warwick, that so many of the ideas captured in what Ramona's just talked about, uh, and also this idea of Modi connection of things together in one um i suppose interconnected network is coming back um as a as a science idea and as an economic idea isn't it and you you have this beautiful phrase think like a forest can you expand on that a little bit and it, it seems to me that think like a forest captures also some of the sentiments that are expressed in those legends Right, I'd like to just follow on for a owner and use the word taio, because that's the word that captures all of this, the Māori word taio. I hope my pronunciation's okay, Ramon. <laughs> taio. Uh, not, not taiho, which means slow down. <laughs> taio is the word which captures exactly what you're saying there, Vince, because uh, what that says is that the forest and the uh, is a combination of a whole lot of of things. And in fact, uh, in European terms, it was the term oikos, it's a Greek word, which has become ecology, and which says that the, that the natural systems are a combination of uh, the soil, the water, um, uh, uh, the climate, and, and the organisms that in it. Uh, and uh, this is the word tie, ties that all together, and has been a word that's been used in Maori culture for a long time. And uh, it's essentially the same as the word ecology that we use today. It's fascinating that they've got them both. And I, I want to refer to something that uh, uh, um, Kiri Allen has spoken about uh, in, in, a little, in a few minutes, because I think it's, it's, it's essential for us to consider that. Sheridan, when you think about native forests, uh, Nati, uh, as a young person, uh, I think you've mentioned this to me before, it, being part of the conservation estate has meant that it's kind of over there. It's something else that is kind of sequestered away. Sequester is probably the wrong word in this climate change times, but you know, um, it is something that's kind of behind a fence, isn't it? And what the challenge is from what Tane's Tree Trust is saying is actually, let's bring it forward. Let's bring it into industry. Uh, can you explain from a young person's point of view, does, how did you perceive native forests? Um, I guess at university I've graduated relatively recently. Um, apart from I think a few papers in first year, native forestry probably wasn't part of our learning because as far as like a professional forester is concerned, that, that native forestry is locked up. You know, it's not for foresting to us. So um, getting involved with Pure Advantage and learning more about Tane's Tree Trust and even just listening to Ramona talk, it's sort of, um, it gives me so many more feelings about the forest and it's so much more than I think that we learn about 
and our professional degrees mm -hmm. at university. Yeah. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, and you mentioned uh, when we were first talking, the idea of actually harvesting native trees seemed like a foreign concept to you. Yeah, I mean, we learn about selective harvesting. We've been to this great beech forest in North Canterbury. There's one place that does it, and that's all I've really ever heard about being able to do that continuous cover selective foresting. Yeah. Well, um, let, let's, let's just go to Europe and see where it's been done for the last 500 years. Mm. And we've <laughs> learned a lot from them. Yeah. Um, continuous cover forestry. Uh, is a well-researched, well-known method of dealing with forest. Mm. Unfortunately, in New Zealand, we had this wonderful resource, which was there waiting for us to cut down. And we got stuck into it, didn't we? There's some <laughs> awful stories. I was reading one today about the 50,000 acres of forest that was burnt down in the Northland in, in one fire. Uh, we got rid of it big time because we had to put grass in. Mm. Um, I think... But, Ramona. Yes. In the Forest Act, it talks about, um, I think in the Forest Act, you know, that's what um, the, the, the Indigenous forestry um, defines, I guess, Indigenous forestry um, for, in as far as New Zealand is concerned. And in that act, it, 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 that was written at a time, 1949, uh, at which, um, during which, uh, New Zealand realised and, re and suddenly recognised that there was no forest or there was very little forest left and that there needed to be a, um, a rethink about how we treated um, these nahere or the remnants of what was once um, the great forest of Tāne or Te Waunea Tāne. Um, and I... Th I I think about the use of the word forestry uh, when we refer to the Nahiri. And as an Indigenous person, that kind of gives me, you know, it, it kind of makes me feel a little uncomfortable when we refer to it as forestry. Can you explain? My preference is that, you know, we talk about things like tree farms, if we're going to be planting plantations or new, new plantations, that we talk about things like tree farms. Um, rather than forestry. Um, so tree farms for purposes that may extend beyond the, uh, the current notion of what forestry is because we've built a, an industry here that, uh, you know, that is built on the colonial uh, model of a forest. Um, and and that colonial model is is uh, resource focused. It's about taking resources and um, creating um, wealth from from those we resources. So when I think about the future of what our nahiri could offer in the way of an economic return, I like to think of it rather than being profit driven because I don't think our nahere should be profit driven. I think it should be definitely profit needs to be part of an equation. But if it, if it is profit driven, then I think it loses its special essence. It loses its ability to, to do all of those intangible, intangible things that are, you know, we all talked about in the, in, in the opening, hmm. um, minutes of, of this webinar and I think as a nation we really need to think about our cultural identity when it comes to our forests and and that cultural identity I think needs to be um, yes we've done some very interesting things with radiata pine and other species I think that that cultural identity should envelop that but there should be a very special part of that cultural identity set apart for Nahere and we should treat it specially, uh, you know, as a result. You use the word wealth and, and wealth in its biggest sense would still capture that. But what I guess what if I 
to interpret what I thought you were saying, I think you were saying you were talking about a very de narrow definition of wealth around financial returns and the yeah. sort of singular focus on just cutting down as much as you can to get a higher financial return. And what you talked about at the beginning was an understanding of wealth in a much bigger sense, in a full ecological and a spiritual sense also. It, it, yeah, a, a holistic approach to wealth. Yes. Um, the, the context that I was, I, I led, you know, into this, this part of the discussion around was around colonization. And the idea of colonization was to go to the nethermost parts of the world and then send those whatever resources you were to find there back yes. to the motherland to mm. to to support the motherland and i think we need to move away from that as a, as a nation we need to kind of redefine ourselves you know at, at some point somebody thought this is, of this as the antipodes um this in australia as the antipodes the nethermost parts from from the motherland i think you know we're 200 years later and we're still operating uh, as a nation on that model. And when we're thinking about um, nahiri, tree farms, indigenous forestry, I'd like us to think about what that means. And well, what um, does that mean for you, Warwick? You talk yeah. about the the full benefits. Yes, I, of I'd, I'd like forest. to. So, so tell us, you know, expand. What are the full benefits of? Yeah, there are a whole lot of points forest. there, Ramona, I'd like to take up on. The first <laughs> one is that Māori, right from the very beginning, did continuous cover forestry in the Nahiri. Hmm. They would take a tree out, make a canoe out of it. They would take saplings out and build buildings. They treated it as continuous cover forestry, if you like. Uh, and and, and, and uh, you've got to believe that. Uh, that's what happened. And this is exactly what we advocate for. There are so many values. Uh, one of our members has just written a paper. It's just being published right now. It's 100 pages long, which talks about the non-timber values of native forest. There have been attempts to value those in dollar terms. I have attempted to stop people doing that because the moment you do that, someone's going to find a problem with it. But you can value it in subjective terms and say, how, how much do you value this forest? Uh, for whatever value you'd like to see in it. Uh, and that, that may be landscape. Uh, it, it, it may be uh, heritage values. It may, be, it may be you're putting this forest in for your grandchildren. It may be for water quality. It may be for soil uh, uh, quality, all sorts of things. There are hundreds of things. Um, and uh, our, we advocate, we, right from the very beginning, we said we have in New Zealand some of the best softwood timbers of the world. We value them for those properties. We should use them for whatever properties they are valued for uh, because we take a uh, wrong way out of the forest. We take food from the forest. Why don't we take trees from the forest in such a way that the Nahi retains all of its other properties? We've actually done three trial loggings of Tortura in the north, which do exactly that. And uh, a year after those trees have been taken out, you can't see where they were taken from. So it is possible to do this. And right from the beginning, Tani's Tree Trust said the way to get people to actually value forest is to ask them what are all the values, which includes the value of the timber. And uh, if they're able to take that value out, uh, then well and good. So that's continuous cover forestry. Um, I, I, I could go on. We're obviously living in a climate crisis. Yes. What is the contribution? And uh, um, Ramona or, or Sheridan, perhaps, um, what's the role of native forestry in addressing climate change? What, what capacity does our native forest have for sequestering carbon for instance i'll let sheridan answer first and then i can i can back her up if that's okay <laughs> yeah um i guess for me in that sort of ideal world it's the long-term solution for sequestering carbon for climate change forever basically you know it's sort of the um the slower build, but after that, it's 
kind of those those trees are going to be on the land for a longer time and in terms of climate change and then not only like offsetting but they're going to continue to be in our landscape forever like we're not just trying to offset emissions anymore we'll just be actively mm. sequestering that carbon forever mm. yeah and that's native forests and that's not the current exotic forestry model that we have mm. The interesting thing is that um, New Zealand hasn't been able to quantify the sequestering capability of native trees to this point. And Scion, sorry. Who's, who's... We have. I'm sorry, we have. Um, well, let, finish that well, thought, Ramona, yeah. and then we'll yeah, come I'm, back I'm to work. I'm not quite finished with that. I, I'm talking in, in terms of the ETS. And the ETS and its 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 ability to quantify um, the the sequestering uh, capability of trees um, as a as a tool, I guess, for climate change mitigation, um, and. One of the things we, we had an ETS workshop here, well, not a workshop, a, a, a um, regulations review with, with Tao Māori a couple of weeks ago here. And one of the things that came through quite strongly was the message that um, Nahiri is an intergenerational solution. It's a solution that could, could last 800 years. And that, yes, um, radiata pine and, and potentially other exotic species might grow faster in the short term but if we're thinking about the generations to come and about the world that we're trying to um to 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 um prepare for you know or, or prepare the foundations for then we need to look intergenerationally and this again is a a failing, I might put it that way, of of um, our our view of forests, our our national view of forests, our our accepted national view of forests is that forests are things that that you put in the ground and then you cut them down at twenty seven or thirty or fifty years and then they uh, they grow back. Well there is another type of forest that lasts a longer time that does take a little while to ramp up um, and and get going but once it does it has the potential to provide an intergenerational climate change mitigation uh, for our nation and for the world and i think what's here is an opportunity for new zealand to show the world you know, other parts, other parts of the colonised world, how to do this. We've got an opportunity to to redefine um, the benefits of forestry, forestry and indigenous species. Warwick. Uh, Tani's tree trust has produced a carbon calculator, which is based on by far the biggest uh, data set of native forests, far bigger than forest research ever had. Uh, it's been, been generated by our own staff. We've produced a carbon calculator, which is based on real data. We know exactly how much carbon the trees can, but uh, unfortunately the lookup tables produced by MTI, MPI were produced on a very narrow set of, of uh, very young trees. And we know that native trees grow very slowly when they're young. Uh, so we, <laughs> We have two data sets. The MPI lookup tables for ETS actually do not do justice whatsoever to the potential of native forest to sequester carbon. Now, let me give you an example, and this is a, a real world example. Um, uh, trees like Kauri and, and Totara, uh, and even possibly Rimu, but particularly those two, uh, when they get up and going after about 20 or 30 years, can be putting on between 12 and 18. Uh, cubic meters of timber a year per hectare. 
And uh, of course, we've been blindsided by radiata at the same time radiata is putting on 30 or 40. And, and so we, having been blindsided by radiata, we can't see past it. Uh, we can't see that in the long term, uh, our native forests are going to hold up much more carbon uh, and, and it will go on doing it for three or 400 years. Um, and, and let's compare what we've done in New Zealand to what uh, the, the average rate of, of uh, um, forest production in North America with the softwoods there is about 14. And Kauri and Tortra will do exactly that. So uh, we're, we're right up there. Our problem is that radiata is something right out way beyond uh, virtually anything else in the world. Uh, so we've got to come back to reality and reality. And, and uh, uh, one of the things that we in Tarnish Tree Trust have been trying to emphasize is the heritage value of forests, the long-term benefits. Uh, and uh, uh, farmers are getting it. Uh, um, unfortunately, our farms turn over once every 10 years. You know, that's a pretty, but there are heritage values uh, for the long term. Hi, Katie Ticker. I would say that science has a role to play in, in advancing the ability of, um, of our native species to help in the climate, uh, you know, the climate um, issue. Uh, science applied to nature um, can uh, help to, um, to accelerate I guess the rate of sequestration, um, you know, so the same science that has been applied to radiata pine can essentially be applied to our native species. So there is a lot of hope there. And, and, and you know, the regulators or the, or the decision makers about what, you know, what, what species to plant where, um, I think are starting to understand and open their minds to the to to, to the wider possibility of what Nahiri can offer to our nation and those full range of benefits that you talked about, Warwick, the both the tangible and the intangible are so important. Mm. Um, and 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 they identify us as a nation. Um, you know, radiata pine. Yes, uh, that's that's a story that we can tell as a nation. But as a New Zealander, you know, I'd like to back a a tree that comes that is endemic from this land. Um, and and just the way it lights up people. You know, when we talk about Nahere, uh, people people just light up. Yeah. So there's so many. Good Great question but... here from one of our um, participants. Uh, Keith Dark from Tasmania is saying that uh, you know Tasmania has fantastic forests as well, um, quite uh, incredible stands of forest. But our state government, this is from Keith, our state government seems intent to develop tourism ventures over retaining our natural asset in an undeveloped state. How is New Zealand managing these development pressures? Do, do I, any of you have a, a point of view about the impact that ecotourism has both positive and negative on our native forests. I know that the government is trying to balance um, the landscape values against the um, the heritage values. There are the way they're classifying um, land and what you can plant on land speaks to that. There, there is a a, a commitment to ensuring that our our um, our distinctive landscapes remain um, and that um, we are that we are making a conscious decision about what to plant where um, I think we've got a little way to go though I think that there are other voices that need to be heard. Tony's Tree Trust uh, is one of those. Um, Farm Foresters Association, uh, Māori, um, and you know, just your general New Zealander, um, uh, I think need to be engaged in that conversation. Um, this, this climate change strategy, which is, um, 
on its way, and we all know it's coming, um, is going to has has is responsible for for a change in a lot of policy. Uh, the RMA um, is going to be replaced by a, a number of different things. Mm. The ETS, um, the way we treat biodiversity and indigenous species. Um, conservation I think you'll find will, will kind of start to disappear from from the language and we'll start to use more holistic more New Zealand specific terms to describe things I think this the if I were able to um, influence um, the state, uh, government over there in, in Australia, I would say that they should listen to their people. They should definitely listen to the Indigenous people and they should uh, definitely listen to their citizens and their people. Um, you know, just the general, those communities of practice that are passionate about um, ensuring the survival of, of um biodiversity and endemic species because when we remove these species off the landscape then a little bit of our identity and our culture and our heritage goes with that um comes back to this holistic integrated all the benefits mm. seen as in their whole sense, not just the individual. And, and uh, you know, carbon sequestration, again, is is kind of one of those, it's a vertical, isn't it? And seen on its on its own, you would go, you, you would send you down a path of ignoring the benefits of forests as a whole. And um, all of which was a, a way of saying, we've got a great question here from Dame Anne Salmond, who has joined our korero. And she's saying, do we really understand how native forests, not just native trees, sequester carbon? Everything in the Nahiri works together, including the fungal communities underground. As far as I know, there has been very little whole of forest research into carbon sequestration in Aotearoa that inquires into all the elements of the Nahiri, including the plants, plants and fungal communities. Is that is that true, that we, we don't have a sense of what's above and what's below? Uh, well, ha having done uh, that very thing for Kauri Forest, I think uh, we do have we do have some understanding of that. The underground fungal activity, of course, is enormous. Uh, it's not being sequestered; it's just being redistributed down there. Uh, the sequestering site is the leaf, uh, but then, of course, the storage of carbon in the Kauri Forest is absolutely staggering. You've got a leaf litter layer that's up to two meters deep, and it's just loaded with carbon. Right. Um, and it's uh, it, at a pH of 2.8. It's not going to not going to lose its carbon very quickly. Uh, so yes, we have an understanding. In some of our, our old podocarp forests, there's been some beautiful work done in the South Island by Alan Mark and his people on the total carbon storage uh, uh, there. So I think we, we do have an understanding and translating overseas work to our own forests, I think gives us a, a pretty good understanding of that. But can I just touch on the question that you just posed, the previous question. I, I, I've taken visitors to this country to, to uh, Rimu Forest, to Matai Forest, to Kauri Forest, and they're absolutely bowled over by it. It is a magical experience for them, and you can turn it into one for them by talking about the Nagiri. Uh, and if it's done by uh, local iwi, it has another dimension to it, which actually is can be a wonderful tourist experience. And and we must capitalise on that. Um, I, I think we we have a great opportunity, and that's what you said, Ramona, in 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 uh, Tasmania. If they did it that way. You would add enormous value to that tourist experience. Yeah, so it's not one or the other. It's a plus plus. It's a, it's mm. it's an and and an and. Seems to be critical. Well, there's a good question here, um, and this might be one for you, Sheridan. About what does success look like in terms of? I don't know. This this question's about total forest cover. You know, if if, if we're down to thirty percent, what percentage looks like a good number to get to? But that perhaps is 
uh, one version of a bigger question, which is what what does success look like overall? And you've written a great piece in the um, in the whole series about what the future looks like. So tell us what you know, hundred years from now, when you're bouncing a mokapuna on your knee, <laughs> by some miracle you'll be 121. <laughs> um, I guess when I like look at the future with this sort of um, blue sky thinking what I would love to see the future look like is that whole change of values and profits that goes along with what Warwick and Ramona are talking about that people understand that you know this money thing isn't what's going to make you happy you know like just a little bit happy well you yeah. know there's <laughs> but just your the whole understanding of it so mm. you know like what will make you happy is fresh air clean water you know a beautiful surrounding when you walk out your front door when you go down the road you know when you do have your mokopuna with you and you're going out to go biking or just go for a walk through the forest like what will New Zealand look like I mean I hope that we can sort of keep working towards changing people's perceptions around yeah what they value from their environment and basically I think that that needs to start yesterday you know the mm. longer we leave not prioritizing natives in the landscape and where they fit I mean, what would it look like right now if we'd put the same sort of investment into natives in terms of research and money that we did with Radiata? Mm. Yeah, hundred okay. percent. Over to you, Sion. <laughs> we, should, uh, we should start. You can do it. <laughs> we should start with putting native forest into the headwaters of every stream. Yeah, it's steep country, and it's this is where it starts. Uh, if you look at the video that uh, we've turned out, and you'll see uh, Ian mm. Brennan drinking water in the stream that he has revegetated with native forest. He's taken his high country, he's got six streams which originated on his property. He's creating a native forest in every one of those upper catchments. They're quite mm. steep, but uh, he's doing a brilliant job. Mm. And uh, I think that story. would be an aim to start with to revegetate the headwaters. Uh, that, that, that They're not much use for anything else, really, as far as stock are concerned. They're very yeah. steep. But they erode so of... quickly, and that's where our sediment's coming from. Mm. And I think, the... um, you know, coming back to a a Sheridan's vision for the future um, and what she's talking about there, I think, is a redistribution of wealth, a redefinition of what wealth is. Mm. would be one thing and a redistribution of wealth mm. I think would go a long way to to um, New Zealand being able to you know to set up a future for our mukapuna one that they want to to be a part of and what does that redistribution of wealth look like it starts with you know planting um, at the headwaters but but you know, iwi or iwi Māori, I'll say, mana whenua don't even have the, the resources right right now to to replant uh, the lands that have been um, degraded. So so I think there needs to be a recalibration, a recalibration of many things. Uh, something along the lines of what Sheridan's talking about in terms of shared values. We need to look at what New Zealand stands for mm. as a nation and then recalibrate according to that. Um, and yes, um, there's an economic equation. There always has to be. Um, but, but should it be the central point of all decisions? Is GDP the only thing that we should measure well-being by? You mm, know, mm. all of that stuff. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, going to the point about the, the land that is, uh, you know, steep, unfarmable, has previously been called kind of wasteland. Um, and that, I know that's something that's that Māori really resist, isn't it, Ramana? Because, uh, you know, what's wasteful about, um, about a hilltop? Well, we also, well, 
we generally, the indigenous thinkers in Te Ao Māori would also um, resist the idea of fighting climate change. You know, um, I think if we were to think of the natural world as, it's, as having its own ability to manage itself and to renew and re revitalize and, and reinvigorate itself, I think the only thing we as a human race need to do is manage our impact on on the landscape, on you know, on on the land. And if we are able to do that, then I think we get a very different um, we get a very different result. And when you think about things like um, how we manage the impacts of uh, erosion, etc. Um, what about just retiring spaces? You know, the, the idea of retiring spaces into permanent forest. What's wrong with that? Well, it's happening that. naturally in the north. Over yeah. 100,000 hectares of hill country land that was farmed 30 years ago when the subsidies came off, it was not economic. So farmers walked away. What happened? It became a Manuka forest. The birds flew the seeds of Totara into it. It's now becoming a Totara forest. Mm. There's over 100,000 hectares of land that is naturally becoming a Totara forest. Yeah. Uh, it's a brilliant thing to be watching. And this is where one of our members, uh, Paul Quinnan, is doing his research and is doing a trial extraction of Totara. And it's working magnificently. Paul's a great guy. Mm. And he applies that principle of reciprocity. You know, this is, that's what we're talking about. We've got a reciprocal relationship with nature. Mm. If we look after nature, nature will look after us. And that's... Can I just, because uh, yeah. we're just about due to close, I'm going to finish with something that uh, Kerry Allen has, has uh, written uh, in uh, Forest and Bird, right? Uh, and we think of Kerry right now because she's undergoing enormous problems in her own life and, and we should be praying for Kerry right now. But a very perceptive lady, I have to say. And let me read what she's written, which really uh, uh, rang a bell with us and Tony's Treat Us and myself in particular. She says, my focus is probably multifaceted. In the Te Ao Māori arena, we conserve the environment by being able to use the environment. And that might be a different experience for some who see conservation as something you lock up and leave it. My belief is firmly held that we conserve the whenua and we conserve the tire by ensuring that we can use the tire. Mm. I think very perceptive. And I really salute uh, Kerry for making that, saying that to a forest and bird who are the prime lock up and leave it people. <laughs> Well, that's probably a brilliant note to end on. And um, I, I wonder whether um, we uh, have just opened a massive can of worms with all this discussion <laughs> that is basically a series of unresolved questions. But the great news is that we have six more webisodes to go where we can drill into each one of these topics in greater depth, whether it's climate change, uh, whether it's preserving forest from pests, whether it's continuous cover forestry, we have uh, a terrific bunch of contributors lined up to talk who have also written for us on uh, on the website, the Aotato Mahiri um, Peer Advantage website. So um, I would really like to take this moment to thank our guests for joining us, uh, for firing in so many questions. And I do apologize that I've only got to a fraction of them um, Please keep them coming. We will endeavor. You, you probably can't see them, but we have a, a team of crack helpers over there who are ans answering the questions for you uh, in, the, in the text field. So thanks for joining us. Please join us again next week, every Tuesday, uh, same time. And I uh, also would really like to thank our, um, our panelists, uh, what Professor Warwick Sylvester, Sheridan Ashford, and Ramona Radford, thank you for joining us. And uh, I hope you and wish you a very good evening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. No, I didn't worry enough.